I'm Giovanna Cesarani, the faculty director of SESTA, and I want to thank you all for coming, for being here on what is uh, now the third in our virtual SESTA seminar series for this spring like no other. And it is uh, a particular pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Federica Favino. Federica is joining us uh, from Rome in Italy. She's her hometown and where she teaches at La Sapienza, which is the main and historic Roman university. Federica is also the recipient, has been the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, national, international, that have taken her, have taken her in various academic locations throughout the world, from uh, New York to Paris and further afield. And most um, recently, she received a Marie Curie Global Fellowship, which is uh, one of the most prestigious European Union cultural grants that one can get today in Europe. And with this uh, grant, she chose to spend two years at SESTA. And this is where many of you must have met her in person and seen her in person from September 2018 until we closed our space just a few weeks ago. Um, Federica is an expert in early modern science, in particular the work of the followers of Galileo. And she has published on this topic numerous books and articles in particular how these early scientists and their work um, developed in Catholic Rome. She has also recently expanded the scope of her work to include the study of women scientists in 19th century Rome in a very interesting book that I recommend to um, everyone that is going to be published in the next few months. But today she will speak to us about the work that she developed while being a sester uh, when um, she decided to apply digital methods and tools to discover new things about early modern science in Rome and in Italy. And in fact, approaching by digital methods, the crucial and essential question of what did it mean to be a new philosopher in 17th century Italy. So the format of the talk today is the one that we have established with Federica talking to us for uh, uh, more or less half an hour, and then there will be ample time for questions moderated by Dylan. And with no further adieu, here then is uh, Federica Favino talking to us about mapping Galileo's legacy, the Borelli Galaxy project. Thank you, Federica. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna, for this presentation, for inviting me. And thanks, Dillon, for organizing this, uh, the, detail, the details of this webinar. I'm very glad to, sh to, to let you know what I was uh, doing on my desk at SESTA <laughs> in all this uh, time. Um, so, um, uh, you would hardly come across Giovanni Alfonso Borelli's name, the man you see in the picture, <laughs> probably. Yes, uh, in the books on the heroes of Western science. And yet he was a prominent figure in 17th century European scientific culture. Just to give an idea of his contributions to Western thought, to those of you who are not familiar with the early modern history of science, I will only uh, mention that he, he he is known as the father of biomechanics, that is the study of the mechanical laws relating to the movement or structure of living organisms. It is no coincidence that the highest honor bestowed by the American Society of Biomechanics is named after him. This is not all. As Alexandre Coiré emphasized in his by now classical study on celestial mechanics of 1961, Borelli was the first to recognize the, to recognize the importance of Kepler's astronomy, to accept the Keplerian revolution, the ellipticity of the planetary trajectories, and to contribute to break with a, a centuries-old tradition which attributed an ontological privilege to the circular motion 
for Borelli, in heaven as on earth, it is the, uh, the linear motion and the linear velocity that are conserved. This is why Newton paid him the great honor to mention him among his few predecessors in the Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Borelli was, was also one of the protagonists of the research agenda developed by the Accademia del Cimento, one of the first scientific societies in Europe. Established in, in 1657 in Florence by the sovereigns of Tuscany, aimed at developing and spreading the Galilean experimental methodology to all the fields of natural sciences. Borelli took part in all the experiments performed by the academicians on sound propagation, air pressure, resistance of materials, hydraulics. He carried out also systematic telescopic observations of celestial bodies. He was at the forefront in arguing against the few academicians who were followers of Aristotle, but at the same time, he strongly opposed also the neutral epistemological strategy imposed by the, the Grand Duke of Tuscany to the academicians in order to avoid inquisitorial censorship, that is, to inquire into nature through sensate esperienze, sense experiences and hypotheses, without speculating on the causes of phenomena and the ontology of things. Despite Galileo's condemnation in 1633, Borelli always kept a strong theoretical approach to new science. Challenging censorship and the orthodox Ptolemaic Aristotelian worldview, he used atoms and motion to explain a vast range of natural phenomena, from plagues to eruptions, from planetary motions to mechanical forces, even to the human body. He also pursued with the extraordinary energy and method an overall strategy to spread out the cradle of the new philosophy. He told Alla Galileista from the university chairs he held in Messina and Pisa and helped his best students to get lectureships all over Italy, ending up drawing the academic geography of the new science. His ideas were influential even in the society uh, beyond the Republic of Letters. Between 1639 and 1656, for instance, he was a member of the Accademia della Fucina in Messina, a learned society under the patronage of the city Senate, which was meant to provide the city with learned arguments to claim its historical privileges in front of the Spanish monarchy. The Fucina was suppressed by the Spanish government in 1679, after the city's rebellion to the Vaisra, as a breeding ground of political dis dissent. Borelli's role in the revolt is not entirely ascertained, but uh, for sure he caused his ban from the city already in 1672, when the revolt was about to break out. I hope that uh, I provided you with sufficient arguments to show how Borelli's case offers a unique opportunity to address questions that are not frequent on the research agenda of most Galileo's scholarship. For instance, what did it mean to be a new philosopher in the real world of 17th century Italy? Did a new perspective on the world of nature involve for its followers also a new vision of society and politics? To embrace Galileo's philosophy and scientific methodology was a mere theoretical option or rather the result of individual relationships, encounters and experiences? Did the stand against Aristotelian Aristotelianism represent for those who used the name to name themselves as Galileists a way of expressing also a political dissent? In brief, to what extent did the intellectual, social, and political networks of the Galileans overlap? These are the kind of questions addressed by the Borelli Galaxy project the project that I have been conducting at Stanford since September 2018. Borelli Galaxy is a 36 months project financed by European Union program Horizon 2020 within the frame of the Marie Curie actions. 
It is the result of a collaboration between the Department of History at Sapienza University of Rome, where I am institutionally based, and the History Department of the University of Stanford, with the scientific collaboration of Renata Ago and Paula Finland. BORGAL, this is the acronym, has been conceived as a case study among the projects gathered under the umbrella of mapping the Republic of Letters, and has been taking advantage of infrastructure research support and intellectual community of SESTA. Uh, I take the chance to thank once more Paula for, uh, uh, for inviting me and express my sincere gratitude to former uh, SESTA former di director, El Elaine Treherne, Treharn, sorry, to the present director, Giovanna Cesarani, as well as to the whole SESTA staff and community for your wonderful hospitality, help, and support. More precisely, Borgal is being developing within the digital support of NodeGoat. NodeGoat is a web-based data management, network analysis, and visualization environment developed by Lab 11,000 based in the Netherlands. NodeGoat allows scholars to build data sets based on their own data model and offers relational, uh, re relational modes of analysis with spatial and chronological forms of contextualization. The first and preliminary of Borgal's task is to build a union electronic catalog of Borelli's correspondence. When he died, his personal papers got lost. The only extant letters are the epistles that he addressed to his correspondents, which are now scattered through different archives and libraries all over the world, and which have been published separately in journals and essays over the years. As well as uh, his other works, they have never been the object of a complete modern critical edition. I'm also planning to eventually merge Borgal metadata on, on letters with the Union Catalog, catalog MLO, the Early Modern Letters Online, created by the Cultures of Knowledge Project and based at the University of Oxford. MLO provides a permanent open access repository in which individual set of scattered correspondences can be shared and manipulated and their authorship permanently acknowledged. To pour Borelli's letters metadata in EMLO would automatically project Borelli into the European Republic of Letters. Consequently, I modeled Borgal metadata on letters in NodeGoat according to EMLO pre-standardized criteria, as you can see here in the slide. Within the NodeGoat web environment, I'm also and foremost working to build a unified, dynamic, multi-layered network representation that integrates and combines that data from different sources, like letters, but even books, biographies, archive sources, groups, and events of different nature, in order to construct Borelli's deep network as precisely as possible. In order to reveal more information about this network, every node in the network is defined by, the, by its biography, as you can see in the slides. The idea behind this methodology is that each of these information enrich the network for it does not necessarily de derive from the content of the letter, but from the intrinsic network of the content itself. These data are registered as attributes or metadata of the nodes, providing pieces of contextual information that complete the network. You can also visualize this network on a geographical map, as well as to explore it even diachronically uh, through the social network visualization function. Waiting for the da uh, data set reaching a critical mass of homogeneous data large enough to draw general significant conclusions. Testing this explorative approach, I want just to sketch here the results of this methodology as it is applied to Borelli's last will, a document whose autograph has only recently, recently been recovered in the Italian archives. This document suits the purpose quite well since it provides a whole picture of Borelli relationships at a given moment 
for which there are no letters. I will try to show that this document submitted to the kind of digital network analysis methodology, which I just explained, shows us the image of Borelli settled at the core of interwined relationships of different nature, intellectual affinities, social groupings, political loyalties, which shed new light on his last years, as well as on the cultural and political scenario of late 17th century Rome. As you can see, the will is drawn up on December 13, 1680, that is 1679, based on the Nativity Inviction, the day before Borelli's death. It was sealed in the general house of the theorist's father, not far from Piazza Navona, where Borelli uh, had been living since September 1677, when the friars had harbored him who was lacking adequate means in exchange of classes of mathematics for the seminarists. It is not surprising that given Borelli's financial conditions, he, dis, he does not bequeath his heirs money, but only copies of his latest work, the De Motu Animalium, which at the time had not yet been printed, but had finally found a sponsor. Queen Christina of Sweden, who had bestowed her patronage to Borelli since he had arrived in Rome from Messina as a political exile in 1674 and had welcomed him to the Royal Academy that she held at her court in late 1679 had agreed even to bear the printing costs of the book. The De Moto too, plays a paramount role in the document. Without any doubt, it is this book which dominates the self-representation that the testator wanted to display in front of the complex network that he had woven around himself. Um, Borelli considered the motto to be his most important work from which he himself derived a sense of identity, self-respect and personal fulfillment. Therefore, Borelli bequeathed his parents, fellows and friends a book ideally made up of his own flesh and blood. However, the size of the legacy, that is the number of copies of the book, does not seem to, the, to reflect the strength of Borelli's own relation, relationships, its edge weight to use as uh, a social network analysis terminology. Of course, he assigns to Her Majesty the Queen, Christina, all the copies that she will want, so that she will distri distribute them among the European learned men, first of all, among the members of her Royal Academy. Except for one case, uh, inheritance is, is, is the same for everyone. One copy of the De Motu. While the names of the heirs are um, haphazardly named, almost written in the order in which they came to the testator mind. Here is a list of the uh, all the individuals of the cluster that I, that I have identified in the order they are enlisted in the will. The different colors refer to the type of object inherited. The different kind of blue deal with the number of copies bequeathed to each of them. But what happens if we submit this small cluster of names to the digital network analysis? The picture reshapes based on the multi-layer relationships between the testator and his heirs and among the heirs themselves. To make the, the thing uh, a long story short, we can say that the analysis highlights four main, main clusters in Borelli's last network. The first is the clusters of actors that you can see on your left, the Sacchetti brothers, the Marquis Teodoli, the Duke Filippo Nerli, that our relational database recognizes as a clan of patrician Roman families reciprocally bound by marriage ties. If you look at the visualization in the slide, it is apparent that it is Lucantonio Porzio, the broker between Borelli and this cluster of actors. Porzio was a Neapolitan physician and a follower of Galileo on his turn. He was a good friend of Borelli for many years, as well as his personal medical doctor in the last days, the reason why he inherited from him money instead of book. 
The ones we just mentioned were the families which welcomed and patronized Porzio when he moved to Rome in 1670. It is most likely that he shared these relationships of patronage with Borelli and that the latter was pleased to leave them a memory of himself as a sign of gratitude. Lorenzo di Tommaso was Borelli's other medical doctor and friend who took care of him during the illness that led to his death. Borelli had met Di Tommaso during his second stay in Messina between 1667 and 1672. Unlike Borelli, Di Tommaso had remained in his hometown and had actively participated in the armed revolt of Messina against the Spanish rule of 1674-78. The relational database highlights and discloses the other Borelli heirs who, like Lorenzo, had participated in the revolt. That is, Antonino Reitano e Furnari, Giovanni Darces, Pietro Faraone. They were all members of the patrician families who dominated the city council until the defeat of the revolt. Two of them, Reitano and Arches, were members of the, of the Accademia della Fucina, like Borelli, as you can see in the, in, in the slides. Like Borelli, Reitano and Faraone had been members of an uh, alleged faction, so-called La Setta, devoted to defending town privileges and opposes in the Spanish rule. Borelli, with his critical attitude towards the cultural tradition which underpinned even the political power in counter-reformation Italy, strongly contributed to ideologically radicalize this faction, whose members were anti-Jesuits, Republicans, and pro-French. In different but equally dramatic ways, by 1679, they all were settled in Rome as political exiles, lacking any means since their assets in Messina had been confiscated by the Spaniards when back in power. The last to arrive among them was the painter and naturalist Agostino Schilla, who paid tribute to Borelli's memory by painting his portrait on top of his grave. It is not a novelty that once in Rome, Borelli had been an agent on behalf of the rebels in Messina and that he had had intense contacts with the French embassy in Rome, which at the times was run by the intriguing Destre brothers, the, uh, the Duke Hannibal Francois and uh, the powerful Cardinal César. Some clues suggest that Borelli, when the rebels asked for the alliance of the King of France, provided Destre with plans for military machines and with strategic information on Messina terri territory and society. The spies of the Spanish embassy were right to keep him under watch. In exchange, Destre had, had interceded with the King of France, Louis XIV, in favor of Borelli's appointment to the Académie des Sciences. With the, these circumstances in mind, Digital network analysis is able to help us to understand why so many members of the um, clan Rospigliosi, cardinals, relatives, servants, which you can see on the graph on the right side of the slide, appear within Borelli's network. Both the Rospigliosi cardinals, Felice and Giacomo, owned their heads to the King of France, uh, Louis XIV, and to Cardinal Destre. The Borelli, the members of the Rospigliosi clan, as well as the expats from Sicily, in that very specific political conjuncture, for all different reasons, happened to be gathered under the umbrella of the French faction and to be subjected to the influence of its agents in Rome. Queen Cristina had joined that party since 1650s, when Cardinal while Cardinal Desciazzolini was her closest friend. The political alignment strongly affected even the cultural scenario of late, late 17th century Rome. In the fourth and last configuration that you can see in the two graphs on your left, the editorial board of the Giornale dei Letterati is the node that connects the cluster um, uh, which, uh, glad, uh, which gathering the true new philosophers among Borelli's Roman acquaintances, that is Michelangelo Ricci and Francesco Nazzari. 
Ricci, a mathematician and a clergyman, like Borelli, had been a pupil of Benedetto Castelli, Galileo's first and most faithful disciple. Francesco Nazzali, a lecturer on philosophy at the University of Rome and a strong supporter of the French party, was the co-director of the first Giornale dei Letterati of Rome. The Giornale, essentially a newsletter on the um, last findings and publications within the Republic of Letters, conceived along the lines of the Philosophical Transactions and the Journal des Savants, had been founded in Rome by Michelangelo Ricci under the protection of the Medici princes, who were the political managers of Galileo's legacy. In the same period of time, a new scientific academy was established in Rome with the explicit intent to replicate the research agenda of the Civento Experimenters, that is, the Academy of Natural, uh, Natural Experiences, founded by Monsignor Giovanni Giustino Ciampini at his place in Piazza Navona. Despite his prominent role within the Cimento, Borelli was never enrolled in Ciampini's academy. This is an intriguing historiographic question to which uh, digital network analysis can suge suggest answers. Monsignor Ciampini, the founder of this academy, was shifting uh, to the political positions of the Pope uh, um, against Gallicanism probabilism, uh, against the interest of the French court. In the light of my research, I suggest that in this ca case, patronage, ties, and political connections prevailed over Borelli's philosophical interests. He kept on attending the Royal Academy on, of the pro-French Queen Christina, where he talked about arguments of no scientific interest, but he did not join the discussions on the vacuum at Champigny's place, a subject which suited him much better. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Federica. Um, Dr. Favino has uh, very generously agreed uh, to take questions from us. Um, as Giovanna mentioned, Federica is currently joining us from Rome, and this means that she has been presenting both uh, across language lines and late at night. Uh, and in order to be uh, as kind as possible to her, I'm going to ask that you keep questions uh, short, sweet, and to the point. Um, and on that note, I'm happy uh, to open uh, the floor for Questions, as always, uh, please uh, go into the participants menu at the bottom. And uh, at the bottom, there's a little blue button, I believe, uh, with the sort of raise hand icon, if we will uh, use that to register your interest in asking a question. Um, I'll moderate the question and answer period. So I'll turn this over to everybody. Are there any questions? All right, Laura, I see you. I'm unmuting you now. Go ahead, Laura. Great. Sorry, I don't have any video. I broke in my camera. Um, Federica, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. I was wondering, do you see a reflection of the Medici um, patronage in the networks uh, that you're examining? Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes, uh, as to the last cluster, I would say, that is uh, uh, the, the Galilean group. Mm. Um, because um, that is a period of the cultural history in Rome where the, um, where is uh, still strong enough the uh, legacy of the Accademia del Cimento uh, experience, which was uh, basically a way of uh, keep on the uh, Galileans project, you know, which uh, had, uh, had been stopped so abruptly with the uh, trial of 1633. Um, but um, uh, probably I would have to uh, 
to to look more broad in a more uh, broad way to all uh, to the relationships uh, between the Medici and all the groups uh, involved in this uh, in this uh, scenario, because it, which is really uh, very very complicated. Uh, because um, as I try to to sketch out, the um, it, that is a, a moment where uh, where the the uh, the experts for, uh, the experts from uh, Sic Sicilian revolt were in Rome under the protection of France, but in the same time when the uh, French king was abandoning the, uh, the um, Messina, was, uh, uh, was leaving the, the city to, the, to its destiny. So it's controversial. And I don't know which was exactly the position of the Medici in, in, with respect to these events, for example. So uh, thank you. I will look more uh, deep in this, uh, in this aspect. Thank you. Thank you. I was particularly interested in the, uh, the ways in which Medici enmity, the, the, their enemies might be expressed in, in, in the patterns, but I'll look forward to hearing or to reading perhaps more of this in future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions for Dr. Favino? Mm. All right, Giovanna, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Federica, I, it's, um, I hope it's not too vague of a question, but since um, I, I see that it's exciting that you can expose these um, like political networks beyond uh, what is usually has been mapped in terms of uh, uh, scientific intellectual networks, but what is the um, nature of these politics? Like, is it, um, I mean, and, and uh, explain it to me as, a, as, an, uh, as an outsider to this question. Like, is it, um, I know a little bit about the uh, Messina revolt. I wonder if there is like a way that the Galileans share a certain political vision or is it, what is it, are they different among them? I mean, like, what, how would you define the, the politics? Uh, yes, so, um, I don't think that the Galilean had a specific uh, political position. It basically depend, de depends on where they lived in, uh, which, in what uh, different uh, uh, situations, political, uh, and environmental, and uh, uh, in the, the different um, realities where they happen to live. Um, uh, I think that um, the, what is interesting is when the Galilean attitude, the, 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 um, uh, the, yes, the attitude of new philosophers to, to criticize, to not assume passively the, the tradition, uh, move to another, uh, to, to the political ground. Now, I, uh, th the other thing is that I don't think that this is a problem to be, um, to be considered starting from the ideas, okay? Because uh, probably we have to, to, to look at the, the, um, the political uh, dynamics of early modern Italy, more uh, from the point of view of groups, factions, and uh, social gatherings uh, which, uh, which shape, shape and reshapes according to more specific social and economic interests in the, in the specific moment. Uh, so uh, in the case of the Messina revolt, what is uh, evident is that the presence of um, Neoteroi, new philosophers like Borelli and his uh, students, for example, Marcello Malpighi and Carlo Fracassati, for example, the one who he, he, uh, he uh, sponsored 
as lecturer on his own chair, uh, were um, very important to, uh, to develop the political, um, uh, the, the political discussion and the, uh, um, uh, yes, this, uh, um, to, to orient, to lead this, uh, the, uh, the, the anti-Spanish revolt in a very ra radical uh, and um, in, in a very radicalized um, and exit to lead it to the to to br break the loyalty towards the government. Um, uh, if you if we look at other uh, at other realities, for example, in Rome, let's say, um, uh, each situation has to be considered uh, in particular. But for example, Matteo Ricci, the one I uh, Michelangelo Ricci, the one I already mentioned. The, uh, who in uh, 1679 was about to become a cardinal. He was a member of many uh, congregations, for example, the congregation of the index. And we have clues that uh, show uh, the way he um, voted wh when he had to uh, pronounce on, uh, on heterodox or alleged heterodox books, for example, on atomism, uh, which was one of the, of the hot topics in that, in that period. And uh, we know that uh, in many occasions, Ricci voted against the condemnation of, uh, of uh, atomistic books. But at the same time, um uh, yes he was uh, he was not completely against the system so to say yes, uh, specifically in that period uh, but we can consider another galilean who is antonio liva who, who who for example was who uh, was another one who came from tuscany who lived in pisa who participated in, in the Shim who uh, took part in the uh, Naples, uh, in the revolt of Naples in 1647-48. So I don't think, uh, or, or better, um, I think that the, uh, the, the, the real goal of this, uh, of this uh, uh, project is exactly to, 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 uh, to understand, to detect if there is a, a real line uh, which uh, um, underlie all these different kind of movements. This, I think that this is the real interest to consider this group as a whole, because I decided to focus just on this uh, small cluster because it's easy to capture the dynamics in a, uh, in a, a small picture. But when I will have uh, at my disposal all the, uh, the, the whole group of uh, Borelli's correspondent, probably it would be easy, more easy to, to better understand the dynamics of this kind of, um, of problems. Um, if I can uh, say something more what is really intriguing for me is the diff is that uh, the relationships between the, the, the new philosophy and uh, politics uh, has never been uh, um, a focus of interest for for um, for historians of science and for early modern historians as to catholic as to italy and the catholic countries uh, unlike what happens for uh, for the Protestant countries, no, because uh, for uh, for example, for England, the, rela the relationships between Francis Bacon and uh, and um, the, um, Bacon's philosophy and the different mo movements who participated in the in the uh, civil war and the uh, middle of 17th century is. Uh, is an argument, is something which is well known. And so um, my, my real question is, what happens if we 
move if we shift this kind of, of problematic on the uh, Catholic uh, um, reality in the Catholic world, yes, of Counter Reformation Europe. Any more questions for Federica? All right, I think that will do it. Uh, please join us next week at the same time Ben Alberton will be presenting. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Have a good afternoon, everyone.